Well, hello friends. Welcome to Ask Zach. Today we are going to talk about Bernie Ledden. So the reason why is that uh, I was at the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, a couple weeks ago with my family. I took them because I wanted to see there was a new exhibit called Western Edge. So this goes back a little bit further in that I went to see the final show by the Desert Rose Band with Chris Hillman and John Jorgensen and, and, and those amazing group of players. And then after that, I really wanted to see the, uh, the exhibit that, uh, that brought about this concert and everything. And it was all about California country rock. So I went there and I was amazed to see things like the Flying Burrito Brothers outfits there, the ones from the first album that, that Graham, like, you know, that, that one's been on display, but now you had Hillman and, uh, and Sneaky Pete's, you know, or Chris, Chris Etheridge, you had th three of the outfits. So I guess they were missing one, but they had three of them. And then I saw it, I saw the guitar. So they had Bernie Ledden's B-Bender Telly. So the one on Peaceful Easy Feeling and Tequila Sunrise and all those all those great tunes by the Eagles that feature a B bender. And frankly, the uh, I mean when you talk about a B bender and you're talking to the average person, you know, you might have a hard time saying, Oh yeah, it's like on this tune. Well, it's really easy to mention Peaceful Easy Feeling. Well, it's a guitar sound that you hear on the Eagles Peaceful Easy Feeling. Everyone has heard that song. You know, it's the, you know, it's on the Eagles Greatest Hits album, which at times is the greatest selling album of all time. Uh, so, yeah, so I decided to do an episode about Bernie. We're going to talk about that guitar and uh, talk about his influence outside of the Eagles and, and things that I love him and his playing for, you know, outside of the Eagles, because he did a lot of cool work with some of his old California country rock buddies through the years. So yeah. So while you're thinking about it, if you haven't done it already, uh, please hit subscribe. And if you've already done that, then I appreciate you supporting the show. The best way is Patreon, which you'll find a link down in the description. There's also tip jar information in the description, or you can go to askzack.com and you can go to the store and you can find things like this, uh, you know, schematic, amp schematic shirt, or maybe an ask that coffee mug. And that helps the show keep going. So I appreciate everyone that has done that. All right. So Bernie Ledden, uh, while born up in Minnesota, he ended up down in Gainesville, Florida, which of course, for some reason, Gainesville is kind of a hotbed of, of music. And, uh, Besides, I mean, you could list off a number of people, but just the easy ones would be Don Felder, who ended up also being an Eagle, and then Tom Petty, that was, you know, of course, younger and uh, lived down the street. So, uh, you know, Bernie kind of went back and forth, and uh, he, he had worked some with Chris Hillman in the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers. Oh my goodness, what, what kind of name is that? It's not as bad as like Strawberry Alarm Clock or the 13th Floor ele Elevators, but that's quite a name there. Uh, and then he ended up going back out to California to play with Hearts and Flowers. What, like most bands, Hearts and Flowers falls apart. Well, then he ends up joining uh, Dillard and Clark. So, which of course was one of the Dillards and Gene Clark from the Birds, the main vocalist. And they end up, you know, writing some tunes and it was Bernie kind of writing some instrumentals and such. And they cut a record and then the band falls apart, of course. And then he runs into Chris Hillman, who his band is already falling apart, the Flying Burrito Brothers. And... You know, Graham is already trying to hang out with the Rolling Stones all the time and is starting to, you know, do some uh, substances and such. And uh, and so he ends up asking Bernie to join. And, uh, and so Bernie joins the Flying Burrito Brothers. And, of course, it's uh, short-lived. Graham ends up leaving. Rick Roberts comes in, and they kind of become more of a smooth... Uh, easy listening kind of version of California country rock and, uh, and Bernie leaves and he's been 
kind of playing off and on on the side with uh, Linda Ronstadt, who's a friend of his. And through that association, of course, you know, again, you have to remember that this is a small, you know, pool of guys that are playing this style of music. So he's running into Randy Meisner. He knows Don Henley and Glenn Fry, And uh, Don and Glenn and Randy have already, you know, they're putting a band together. And they're looking for the fourth guy. And they ask Bernie. And so Bernie's the last one to join of the original four Eagles. And it's pretty apparent from interviews and just from the way they acted that they wanted to do everything right with the Eagles, that those guys, all four of them had experienced success and failure and being taken advantage of, and they all wanted to do things the right way. And, you know, Don had been in Shiloh that fell apart. Uh, Glenn had been in Long Branch Penny Whistle. You know, of course, Randy had been in Poco and then left after the album was, was cut. And also, of course, had been with Rick Nelson. And uh, yeah, I think they, they all wanted to learn from their mistakes or the mistakes that they observed and kind of create the, uh, the perfect California country rock band. And, uh, I think, you know, they, as, as close as you could, I think they, they did it with the Eagles and, uh, Bernie was a huge, you know, contributor to their sound. I mean, you have to remember that on the first two albums, it's four guys and that first album, you know, right out of the, right out of the box, they had hits, they had hits with witchy woman, which Bernie had co-written and it's more of a rock tune. So that's, that goes against all the guys that say Bernie didn't want to rock Well, he co-wrote witchy woman and played guitar on it and then you have uh, take it easy which features fantastic you know intro and solo on on a telecaster by bernie and then he also plays this fantastic banjo part that's later on in the tune that really kind of gives it a lift um yeah then you have peaceful easy feeling which is just a a, a beautiful you know tune that is still being played by bar bands you know every second of every day somewhere in the world. And that features some really, really gorgeous B-Bender work. And uh, of course I played the second half of the solo. The first half is, uh, is really some really sweet Bender work with some kind of melodic work overdubbed over top of it. But uh, the second half of course is a little more exciting because he goes to the bridge pickup and uh, starts twanging out a little bit more. So. And that has to be you know, the biggest hit that features a B-Bender on it, you know, heavily. So, yeah, so he, uh, you know, you have the banjo, you have the acoustic guitar work, you have his knowledge of bluegrass and folk and, and harmony. And, uh, yeah, and, and he was, and he was writing and that band was, was, was really great. And I don't think it's fair to really call him the lead guitarist per se, because Glenn was also a really great guitar player. They were both lead guitar players. Uh, Glenn, you know, of course, you'd hear him on things like Already Gone, or uh, better yet, you know, you have the Timothy uh, B. Schmidt hit later on in the 70s with I Can't Tell You Why, that's all Glenn Fry, you know, playing, you know, the all the fills and the solo on it. And that that shows you what a what a great arranger, songwriter, guitar player, Glenn Fry was. So, you know, they were, they were definitely a sum of their parts and they just sounded insanely good when they harmonized together. And, uh, and they created an amazing first album and then they followed it up with a concept album that was kind of a dud. It did end up producing, you know, Tequila Sunrise as a minor hit and then uh, Desperado, there'd be a hit later, um, and a, f a fan favorite and, uh, yeah, but it wasn't until, you know, on the border that they really started uh, hitting their stride again. And that's also when you start seeing uh, Don Felder guesting, and then he joins the band after that. And then they make the uh, One of These Nights album, which, of course, that's when uh, Bernie starts getting more frustrated with the band. And I think, it, I think it's, again, an oversimplification to say he didn't like the direction the band was going musically. And maybe he didn't, but I think the the band, uh, it's obvious that they, it was such a high pressure situation. And I think they were, you know, Don and Glenn were really wanting to go in more of a arena, 
you know, kind of atmosphere. And I don't know that Bernie wanted to do that. And I think the toll of it got to him and then it got to Randy and then it got to Don and Glenn, you know, because the band, you know, exploded, uh, or imploded, whichever, whichever you prefer, you know, by, by 1980 and they were, uh, they were done. So it took a long time for them to get, get back together again. So when, uh, when Bernie left the Eagles, he, uh, you know, he continued to be involved in projects and I love, you know, some of his, uh, you know, guest work. So I remember the first time I heard this album. So this is, uh, you know, Emmy Lou Harris's Pieces of the Sky. And this is a fabulous album. Of course, this was her first album for Warner Reprise. And, uh, you know, Bernie is all over this thing, singing harmony and playing acoustic. And he plays fantastic dobro on Bottle Let Me Down, along with James Burton playing, of course, uh, Telecaster. And, uh, you know, really, really great, great stuff. Also, uh, Emmy Lou's next album, uh, which is Elite Hotel, features Bernie uh, playing a, a beautiful acoustic guitar solo on the tune Sweet Dreams. And it's an overdub. So they uh, they had recorded the song live with the hot band, and then they decided to overdub an acoustic guitar solo over, uh, <laughs> it's actually over Hank DeVito's steel solo, which I guess they feel didn't have enough uh, movement to it. So they, they had Bernie play this solo that kind of fills in the gaps in Hank solo. So I guess to be really fair, it's Hank DeVito and uh, Bernie Ledden soloing at the at the same time, you know, kind of trading off. And uh, yeah, so uh, Bernie, you know, of course, did a did a solo record or a, a duo record. And, uh, and then you really didn't see much from him. And he started working some with Chris Hillman, you get the Ever Call Ready album, which of course, I talked about that in the Desert Rose Band episode that was Chris Hillman and Bernie and Al Perkins and some others doing kind of a gospel bluegrass album. And because Bernie was playing in Chris Hillman's band at the time. And so Bernie left Chris Hillman's band to join the Nitty Gritty Dirt band. And that left an opening and that's where John Jorgensen comes in. But uh, Bernie went to the Nitty Gritty Dirt band and uh, during when the, the Dirt Band was having quite a bit of uh, chart success with things like uh, Fishing in the Dark and other tunes, Hold On. And uh, so Bernie was in the band for a short time. And uh, there's funny footage of, uh, of that era nitty gritty Dirt Band, or Dirt Band, I should say. That's what they were being called at that point on uh, Nashville Now, hosted by Ralph Emery. And of course, Ralph Emery, as much as I love him, he was also... Uh, really good at putting his foot in his mouth. And so, you know, they're, he's kind of interviewing the guys in the dirt band. And then he just asks, you know, he didn't, his question to Bernie is when are the Eagles going to get back together? <laughs> and it's just like, really, I've just joined this band and we're having success. And you're going to ask about a group that I quit 10 years ago and have nothing to do with, except for, you know, probably getting mailbox money from them. But, uh, Anyway, it was funny. And so then, uh, you know, kind of continued to see Bernie uh, guesting and, and even doing some producing, like with Restless Heart and uh, playing on sessions. And so, you you know, if you if you look up Bernie's, you know, kind of discogs or all music, you'll see that he played on a fair amount of sessions here in Nashville on, on a variety of country and kind of bluegrass and country rock type projects. Well, then he kind of had a fun uh, little era where he did a kind of a... Uh, a fun project where he, he had some friends of his and they did a, a band called Run C and W, which was where they did bluegrass versions of Motown tunes. And again, this was the early nineties and they wore kind of, uh, I don't know. I mean, it looked like sometimes they were wearing workout clothes and sunglasses and stuff. They looked, they looked pretty crazy, but, uh, anyway, they, they were fantastic. And, uh, Bernie got to play a lot of banjo and, uh, yeah, didn't didn't see a whole lot of Bernie for a little while after that. I think he worked at a label for a while and did a variety of other things. Then all of a sudden, the uh, the Eagles were uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and as part of it, they had all the various members. So 
They didn't just have the five that were part of the Hell Freezes Over tour. They also had Randy Meisner and Bernie Ledden, of course, both original members. So they had all seven Eagles that were you know, all alive at that point, and they all performed together, and they did uh, Take It Easy, and they did uh, Hotel California, which, of course, Bernie was not part of. But, uh, yeah, they did that. Then, I, while I was living in France in 99 or so, I picked up an album. It was Emmylou Harris and Linda Ronstadt together. And, uh, and it was a, a beautiful you know, duets album. And all over the record was Bernie Ledden. And then when I saw footage of them uh, performing on television, Bernie was in the band and he was playing this black telly with a Parsons White bender. And uh, yeah, beautiful stuff. Uh, then, you know, fast forward a number of years, I saw, I saw Bernie play at a festival up in Canada. So I was up there working and, and this was in the middle of nowhere in Canada and, uh, Bernie showed up in his white suburban with Tennessee plates on it, unloaded his black face twin and his telly and uh, he had a couple other things and he and a fiddle player just, you know, performed, you know, as a duo and they even did the, the tune My Man, which was, of course, his tune that he dedicated to Graham Parsons that was back from the Eagles era. So, uh, yeah, didn't, didn't see, uh, you know, again, you know, he seemed to lay somewhat low. And then, lo and behold, you know, the Eagles did this uh, History of the Eagles documentary. And on it, there's, you know, Bernie talking about his time in the band and they, of course, they talk about the whole, you know, pouring the beer on the head of Glenn Fry, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but you can tell that uh, Bernie, you know, didn't, didn't feel good about it, that, that he was, you know, apologetic about it. And so then not long after that, it was announced that Bernie was going to be touring with the Eagles again. And, uh, so that was that was really neat because that's kind of the last thing you ever thought was going to happen, um, you know. Because of course he had quit the band in '75, and uh, so here it was, you know, 30 plus years later. How many? And uh, there he is up there, you know, playing the B bender and uh, and the banjo and singing harmonies and uh, you know playing all those tunes. And they'd even start off the show with uh, you know Don and Glenn, and then they'd bring Bernie out and. And Bernie would sing a tune, and they would do Peaceful, Easy Feeling, and, and then they'd do Witchy Woman, and then they would kind of strike things, and then he would uh, play with the, uh, you know, with the, the full band, with the, you know, of course, the uh, B3 and all the percussion and backup instruments that are all part of the Eagles, you know, thing now. So, yeah, so I'm... Loved Bernie's playing, you know, through the years, and uh, he's contributed to a lot of records that I love. And uh, let's talk a little bit about his uh, his gear. So his B Bender Telly, which again is on display at the Country Music Hall of Fame, it was originally a 1966 Telecaster, and so here's a picture of it. So that's of course he's got his big, you know, afro, and uh, he's playing it. It's of course blonde or white with a rosewood fretboard. So the guitar gets stripped of its finish, and then Dave Evans puts a B-bender in the guitar. So this is, so, Bernie ends up being, you know, one of the earliest users of the B-bender. Now, yes, there were guys in Nashville using, you know, a, another type of bender back in the early 60s that had little levers right here and it was usually installed on something with a stop tail piece like an ES355 or 335. Guys like Jerry Kennedy and Grady Martin who were A-team guys for sure. But, you know, of course you have Clarence, you know, the first guy with a Telecaster where you have the mechanism where the strap attaches to it. So, and then the second one would be Bob Warford where he and his dad actually created one. And again, this was uh, outside of the body. So part of the mechanism is in the body and then part of it's outside. And then you would have to have this shell over the top. And that's why on Clarence White's guitar that Marty Stewart plays, why it's thicker. It's because it's got a shell on top. Well, even um, Bob Warford's telly also has that same kind of shell, but I think his is actually a little bit thinner. Well, Dave Evans was the first one to put it 
inside the guitar and then have the big plate that just covers, you know, kind of an L-shaped plate, or his is actually quite a bit bigger. And many times he would put them in butcher block bodies and he would just sell these butcher block bodies that had the bender already in it and you would put your own neck and pickups on it. And so that's what, oh, Albert Lee had one like that. I even had one for a while that I had and then I, I gave it to a friend and then my friend ended up uh, sending it off to Dave Evans more recently and Evans was able to start uh, making them again for a while. But uh, with back to Bernie, Bernie had the Evans pull string because he called it a pull string, not a V bender. He had the pull string put in his 66 Tele. And so that's what you see him you know, playing early on in the Eagles. And so it has the, still has a rosewood board, but it's missing the Fender logo. The finish has been stripped and it's got a humbucker in the neck position. And then it's got a Gibson style toggle switch. Effects at this time would have been minimal. Uh, you can hear some phasing used on things like Midnight Flyer and such, but uh, not a lot of effects. And amp-wise, they were small. Most of the time he was playing a Princeton reverb on stage or a deluxe reverb. Sometimes in the, the, in the last era, you know, kind of the one of these nights kind of tour era, uh, you see him using a silver face Vibralux that has kind of a Western motif grill on it, grill cloth. Uh, and that's, you know, and he used that telly, you know, of course he'd use some kind of Martin acoustic and, a, and an old Gibson mandolin and, uh, and a, a Les Paul deluxe for playing the more of the rock-ish tunes. And he got a, a, a 53 telly toward his, the end of his time with the Eagles and he ended up switching the parts on the B-Bender telly. So he took the 66 neck off and put a 53 neck on, and he took as much as, he could, as, much as he could off the 53 telly and stuck it on the uh, 66 Telecaster body that had the Evans pull string. That guitar ended up getting damaged later on, and he ended up replacing it with a, uh, a kind of parts guitar that was uh, black with white binding and with a rosewood fretboard neck and with a Parsons white bender. And that's the guitar that you see him play throughout the 90s and on the history of the Eagles tour and footage of him with Linda Ronstadt and Emilio Harris in the late 90s and such. That's, that's the guitar you see him with. Um, when he uh, went on the road or back out on the road with the Eagles, I actually contacted uh, one of the guitar techs with the Eagles and they were willing to uh, relay to me what uh, Bernie was using. So they even sent me a pic picture of his pedal board. So here it is, all, all in its glory. <laughs> so, you know, I love it. This is, you know, this is, you know, the simplicity. This is all he needed. So again, you see a compressor and, uh, you know, CS3 compressor. You see, a, you know, Dan Electro, uh, Daddy O, you know, distortion. And you see the, uh, the Boss DD3 delay or maybe it's a DD5, I'll have to recheck the picture. And then an old, you know, original run TC chorus. And you can even see it has his name scrawled into it, all on a pedal train board. So then amp wise, uh, looks like he had like an Acoustasonic amp for acoustic. And then he had either a, uh, a Brown Deluxe from the early 60s, which is a, of course a great amp, got mid-range bark to it. Or a lot of a lot, many times you would see him with a uh, a reissue Tweed Twin, like a 50 watt Tweed Twin, and that's even what he plays at the Grammys right after uh, after Glenn's passing, and that uh, Jackson Brown joined them and they did uh, take it easy. So yeah, so that was kind of his his gear and such, and I just think Bernie's such an important part of the early Eagles sound. And uh, both, you know, his, his vocals, his songwriting, his instrumental prowess. I mean, the fact that he played pedal steel and dobro and mandolin and all sorts of stuff. And he kind of, he was one that really kind of pushed that where it was kind of like everyone had to kind of come to that. And so that's why there was, you know, when, when, uh, you know, Don Felder, when Jill Walsh joined the band, they had to, they had to play keyboards and banjo and, you know, pedal steel and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, there you have it. And so I'll have a, uh, a Bernie Ledden, uh, you know, kind of uh, playlist 
that I'll put a, there'll be a link down in the description. All right, now it's time for our ongoing series, Zach's Book Time. This is a book I just recently read and, uh, and enjoyed. It's called Buddy Emmons, Steel Guitar Icon by Steve Fischel. So Steve Fischel has been a, a wonderful writer, uh, but I mean, what he's best known for is for playing uh, pedal steel guitar in Emilio Harris's hot band. So he joined after Hank DeVito left in the early 80s, and he played that wonderful Weisenborn solo on the trio record on Those Memories of You Still Haunt Me. Yeah, that uh, beautiful, beautiful Weisenborn intro and solo uh, is uh, Steve. Uh, he also produced big hit records for uh, Radney Foster, like Just Call Me Lonesome. That was uh, Steve producing that, and he also produced hits for, uh, for Pam Tillis and, and other acts. And he went back out on the road with uh, Rodney Crowell and Emilio Harris when they, they did a tour a couple of years ago. And Steve has also been a writer, and so he's done interviews through the years. And so if you have old guitar player magazines, you've probably read some of his interviews. And so some of the, he interviewed Ry Cooter and Wadi Wattel and James Burton and Albert Lee and on and on because all these guys were his contemporaries, people that he was working with and knew from being part of that scene. And so more recently, he, um, well, in the last decade or, or more, he was spending time with Buddy Emmons. And Buddy had written down um, kind of his own memoirs up to a point and Buddy gave them to Steve, and then Steve spent a lot of time with Buddy before he passed, and also interviewed a ton of, you know, the old guard that, that really knew Buddy well, including, you know, Ray Price and Willie Nelson and on and on. And this is a fantastic book. It's a, a wonderful, you know, biography of, of Buddy Emmons that, uh, you know, really tells his story, and it's an amazing one. I don't care whether you play or love pedal steel or not. This is a fantastic book. It's well-written, really gives his kind of upbringing, his musical history, just some of his the problems that he had and how they kind of influenced his career. Also, just how important he was in the development of the pedal steel guitar. I mean, he really developed the modern you know, pedal setup, uh, the co-pendant or whatever, I, you know, the, those phrases that pedal steel players use. But, you know, if you play a pedal steel guitar, well, it's set up that way because that's what Buddy developed. And he is so important and his playing is so important. So I highly recommend Buddy Emmons Steel Guitar Icon by Steve Fischel. Check it out. All right, guys. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode talking about Bernie Ladin, of course, talking about Buddy Emmons, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.